Good morning. Well, I guess the teens are with us today. It was extremely hot this morning. We were setting up Sunday school, and now, now it's overcast. So we maybe made a bad decision, but we thought we'd eat donuts in front of you and just have a little bit this morning. <laughs> Uh, Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. Good morning, Charlie. Good morning. <laughs> Glad see you all back. Here. Glad you all are back. I kind of miss you all. It's kind of empty. Glad you all are here. And kind of quiet, too, actually. <laughs> I tried to make it loud, but I'm not loud enough, I guess. <laughs> okay. Judges chapter 11. Um, we'll start at verse 1, and then we're going to skip down. Uh, Joel did an actually really excellent job covering Jephthah last week, and then also just... Um, Jeff? He covered Jeff? Jephthah. Jephthah. Oh. Jeff the what? And then the, 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 two, the two previous, uh, what do you call it? The two previous... Um, well, he's actually the, pro uh, not the, pro the judge. Jeph the judge. Uh, Can we kind of stop in the middle? I think. Yeah, yeah. We were, we're, well, we're going to address his vow today because you pretty much covered most of everything that I would have that, that covered. But just to, just to get kind of recap, uh, we're in Judges chapter 11, verse 1 right now. Okay, so now Jephthah the Gileadite, um, Gileadite was a mighty man of valor and he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begat Jephthah. Okay, so his dad is Gilead. Uh, he's going to live with their portion. Their lot would have been east of the River Jordan uh, rather than on the west side because there would have been one of the few that didn't want to cross over. Um, but he in particular was son of a harlot. If you would read down further, then you'd see that he wasn't accepted of his brethren because his mom was a harlot. Uh, nevertheless, uh, he uh, was Israelite because of his dad. And then he... Uh, is called here a mighty man of valor. So in other words, he had integrity. And it wasn't just that he was courageous and he was strong, but he actually had character to him and integrity. Even though uh, he would gather, or there would be vain persons that would be gathered to him. Um, skip down to... Go down to verse 29. Okay, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead, and Manasseh passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. Okay, so the, the Ammonites were coming and attacking uh, Israel, and they were oppressing Israel, and if you recall, God had said, to Israel, you know, go ask the idols that you uh, that you worship to deliver you. I'm done with you. I'm, I'm through with you. <laughs> you guys come to me, and uh, you, you don't want to do anything that I say. Uh, that's paraphrasing, but basically, uh, he had left them to themselves. And then, following God's response to them is where you see that they actually repent. They turn away from their idols. They put away their idols. And they start actually trying to serve God and worship God himself. And then is where we come in and we see Jephthah. Now, Jephthah himself wasn't actually called necessarily. He just happened to be somebody that was in, I guess, he was disposed to go ahead and fight for Israel. He had a burden. Uh, he himself was a mighty man of valor, as was stated. And he was approached. Uh, but God... As different per the other judges, you don't have an actual angel coming to the individual, or you don't have God calling them, or you don't have uh, any specific instance where you have somebody approach, uh, outside of just you have the men of Gilead approach, and then mm -hmm. he questions them, you know, what do you want me now? The same miller as what they had, uh, well, with, um, with, a, with the previous judge in that, that you know, hey, I'm, I'm not accepted of y'all, but you guys want to take me in now. And so he, he goes before 
And now he's, uh, here's where we pick up as far as the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. He passed over Gilead. And then verse 30, he's going to go and battle for them. And this is our subject for today. So Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Haman unto my hands, um, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon uh, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Okay? I will offer it up for a burnt offering. And then, so Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he smote them from Aror, even until thou come to Minnith, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel, and Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only daughter, or excuse me, his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And, he, and she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened my mouth, or if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, uh, do to me according to that which uh, hath proceeded out of thy mouth, for as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for the of thine enemies, even of the enemies, or even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains, and be well my virginity, and I and my fellows. I and my fellows. And she said, or and he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions, and be well her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which was... He did unto her according to his vow, which was, what was his vow? He's going to offer a burnt offering. Did he actually go through and do that? The implication seems that he did. Okay. Is that funny? He vowed for, well, it's interesting. It's like, it's not really funny, but it's pretty interesting. His vow was, I'm going to offer it up. I'm going to give it unto the Lord, and specifically as a burnt offering. Not just give it to the Lord, but I'm going to offered up as a burnt offering, specifically. And so, it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to a vow, which he had vowed, and she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel, that, daughter of Israel, that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in a year. And, uh, well, following into chapter 12, you, you can read further on about um, some of Jephthah, but um, specifically we're going to address the issue of his vow. Okay, so just vows. We see that he actually vowed a vow, um, God's expectation of it, we know from a previous scripture where we're getting ready to look at, is that he would keep it. Uh, question is, is that is that a legitimate vow? His vow specifically, what was it? I'm going to offer, if you would give me victory without fail, whatever comes out of my house to greet me out of the doors of my house, then I'm going to give it to you, but I'm specifically going to offer it as a burnt offering. Okay. Are there any rules governing governing burnt offerings or vows that we know of in Scripture? Should be an animal, a spotless animal. There's actually a few of them, yeah. If we go back into Leviticus and Deuteronomy, if you're going to vow, vow, now mind you, those are voluntary. There are things that God requires as specific sacrifices, uh, but we, I'm uh, sorry, you mentioned something else? No, no, um, Mr. Charles? Oh, okay, uh, all right, so you have the offering of the sacrifices that are as atonement for sin, but you also have voluntary offerings that you can give unto the Lord. And those are, uh, go to Deuteronomy 27, if I'm not mistaken. Deuteronomy 27, I don't look wrong here. Deuteronomy 27, 
show you from the front desk. Is it the parallel verse to Ecclesiastes 5? We're talking about 23, Deuteronomy 23, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 23. Uh, 23, I'm sorry, no, no, it's chapter 23, Deuteronomy 23, I was, I wrote that down wrong, Deuteronomy 23. Uh, you see this repeated again in, in Ecclesiastes 5, it says, when thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack uh, to pay it, the Lord thy God sh uh, will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee, uh, but if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. That which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt keep and perform even a free will offering according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. And so um, this is specifically governing just vows. Um, go to, actually just a little bit further north, verse 17. Um, okay, there shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor sodomite of the sons of Israel. Okay, thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For, for even both of these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now you're asking why I didn't mention that. Okay, there are such things as illegitimate vows, or like in other words, that these these are like really valid vows. And one of one of being. Uh, for a whore of a daughter of Israel, or a sodomite of the sons of Israel. So in other words, God would consider that, you know, you're, if you're going to vow them, because there are rules governing vowing a person, like if you're going to dedicate somebody unto the Lord, as Hannah did with Samuel, then um, that person is to be given. There's supposed to be 50 shekels for a man, and then there's 30 shekels for a woman uh, when given, uh, given to the Lord. But they're obviously to be given to the Lord. Um, but these wouldn't be valid offerings before God. A sodomite or a, uh, a whore of the women, or a sodomite of the male uh, before God. Because even both are abomination to the Lord. So that's not, uh, you know, you don't, you don't present that before God. Okay, but his vows, God expects as far as when you vow a vow, that you keep it. In other words, so. If you don't vow, it's not held against you. But if you do vow, then the expectation is that you are to keep it. So God takes his vows seriously. Um, and then, okay, if we vow a vow, if it's valid, it's binding before God. And then go to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Verses 31 to 33. Okay, it had been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of enforcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, uh, committeth adultery. So, We'll read the following portion for our next point. But um, concerning a vow, right, this is obviously the most common one that we would come across is marriage, at least it's within our society, beyond just what's in the law. Um, actually, marriage preceded the law, nevertheless. But when you vow a vow, God's expectation with regard to marriage, uh, he would state in other portions of Scripture that you know, what God had put together, let no man put asunder. Yeah. And that uh, the divorce issue was never so from the beginning. In other words, God's design and God's intent with regard to that was that 
you have one 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 man one woman you know for life let's you know that separate them but otherwise there's no real um, and when he would be challenged by the Pharisees with regard to that uh, and the scribes he would state them that it was because he would state to them it was because of the hardness of their heart that Moses gave for the writing of the divorcement in other words, he allowed for that because of the hardness of the heart, but that wasn't God's will or God's intent or God's design. Uh, but we see here that though you have, say, somebody put away in God's, I guess you could say, exception to it, would be for the cause of fornication, that the divorced person is basically immarriable unless they were to reconcile with their spouse that they divorced from. In other words, you can't. You're not free to marry somebody because that would be adultery, and then you're not to marry somebody that would have been divorced because that would be adultery as well. So, in other words, that's those aren't as a vow. In other words, you're coming before God to vow. They may be legally binding by our laws, but that's not. In other words, that's not that's not viewed as legitimate by God because that's sin. That's going into sin. That'd be the same difference as going and bringing. Uh, when you to offer of uh, the sons of of Israel a sodomite or if you're bring uh, of the females that would have been somebody that would have been a whore to to God and he doesn't he called that as abomination to him he doesn't view that as that's not acceptable okay so the vow is supposed to be something that would be valid and it goes to stand, stands the reason obviously that you, when you're found before God that it would be something that would be obviously acceptable within God's eyes but it's not and then it leads to our third point which is they're not necessary to carry out God's will in most cases but let your character and integrity do the talking okay in other words they weren't necessary to be for Jeff to, to be able to go ahead and fight and have victory over the children of Ammon was it necessary for him to bow about? No. no. The Spirit of the Lord had already come upon him as he was going forth. Now, he of his own will decided to go ahead and say, God, you know, if you do this for me, then I'll go ahead and do this. Uh, but it wasn't. I wouldn't say there's, there's nothing indicating in the scripture that says that it was necessary. Now, granted, it's just a recounting of what actually happened. Um, but previous to that, the fact is, when God had come upon somebody to use them, he would give victory. He would go ahead and perform on their behalf. He would work on their behalf. He would give grace there. And so it wasn't necessary for him to go ahead and give a vow um, for that to be the case. And uh, for, so for, for our third point, uh, vows are not necessary to carry out God's will. In most cases, let your character do, uh, let your character tell you to do the talking Go down to verse 33. Okay, verse 33. And ye have heard that, heard it hath been said of them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, uh, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, uh, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head. <laughs> Because thou, camest not, uh, thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. All right. So, in essence, what is a vow? At its, at its root, what's a vow? What's a, what's, it's, a what's it? it's a covenant promise. Synonymously, if you wanted to look up covenant covenants, Promises, oaths. It's, just, it's they're all individual words each defined differently, but they are actually are used interchangeably quite a bit in Scripture, Old and New Testament. If you were to, if you were to study out every single time that word is used in, in in its context, and it's not always just given in the context as far as okay, what descriptive, but also you know somebody that had vowed or had committed oaths or had given a promise. So you're Charlie. Yes, sir. Let me ask you a question. He made a vow that affected somebody that was not himself. He made a vow, and that person was his daughter coming out of the house who had nothing to do with the vow. 
did not really, it wasn't her idea, it was his idea. I mean, how valid is a vow? Let's say that I do a vow and I use Charlie for some reason. Now, you're not part of my vow. You don't know about it or anything. Is that really a valid vow? The <coughs> law actually makes accounting for that. You can, uh, as far as offering your children. No, not it as a burden offering, because that's not. That's forbidden. That's, that's, that's why I'm saying his vow wasn't legitimate, because you, had he stopped at just saying offering to the Lord, because Hannah did that, she offered her child. She wasn't even pregnant at the time. She was just praying to God, God, if you give me a child, right. I'll give it to you. I'll return she, to you. She didn't know what the offering was before she made that blanket statement. She, she prayed for a child, and she said, if you give me a child, I'll give them more. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just speaking to the point of, that's a good point, yes, that's true. I was just speaking to the point of, it affected Samuel's life. And he didn't have a say in it. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm trying to tie in with yeah, that. But that really affected Samuel to the good. This vow about the daughter did not necessarily affect her to the good. No, but I mean, he could have given her to the Lord. He didn't have to offer mm. or specifically address that, okay, this is a burnt sacrifice. But the, the law actually gives provision for the offering people. Offering yourself and then offering a uh, son or daughter. And the males would be, or actually not even just son or daughter, but those that would be under, I guess, under your authority. Mm -hmm. But you would have, um, I know it seems kind of weird because it's like, oh wait, we're very individualistic. And it's like, we don't like to think of, okay, man, I'm a slave. <laughs> you know? Just yes. to confirm what you're saying, the law says that a parent can offer their child as a living sacrifice, not to be murdered or killed or yes. burned. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes, yes. so when he stepped over the line, it was the burning and killing and all that stuff. The yes. Okay. Because <laughs> he could have, it would have been, he would have to pay fifty shekels for a son, and then or thirty shekels for a daughter. Is what the provision was in, in, in scripture. In the, in the that that would redeem their life. Yeah. But and then you, I mean, there's other vows that you can give to as well. It's not just limited to, but I'm as far as regarding people. Oh, okay. I guess this is why we call Jeff the foolish vow. Mm -hmm. Because he did vow, vow, and not think. I mean, that's that's the, the force of Deuteronomy 23 and Ecclesiastes 5. And our vows to vow to God that we're not to pay it. The force of it is know what you're getting. It's not the point of those passages of scriptures is not don't make vows. That's not what the scripture is trying to emphasize, but it's saying take vows seriously mm -hmm. and knowledgeably. And well, there's just something about a person realizing, even when we dedicate our life to Jesus and saying, God, I surrender to your will for my life, which a lot of people haven't done uh, because they think it's better not to do that than to do it and fail at it. But the reality of it is just to say, okay, this really does mean I'm on the land. This really does mean I, I no longer consider myself to have a will that's determined by my flesh, but my will is surrendered to God. Now, the difference between surrendering your will to God and making a vow like Jephla did is that God's good, and He makes no mistakes. And you couldn't give your will to God and have Him do something with you that would be inferior to what you do with your own will. If you, if you lived your life the way you chose, it, it wouldn't be even a close comparison to the great things that God does. Mm -hmm. Yet, Jephthah, I mean, really the caveat here is again the point that God didn't ask him to do something and he didn't consider what he did when he did it. And I've seen this a lot of times, not obviously with child sacrifice, but I have seen people disrupt their lives needlessly over commitments and vows. Or I've seen people break covenants and vows needlessly over foolish commitments. For instance, I remember uh, an individual that I knew that used to just promise things without really thinking about what they were promising. If I get my tax return, I'm going to get $1,500 toward this. Well, that's fine. That person, when they would make a promise like that, I'd think, no, you're not. When you get that $1,500 or whatever is the first thing that occurs to you to do, is what you'll spend it on. Because vows mean nothing to you. And then other people promise things, you know, with a real cavalier attitude without considering. And then it really costs 
not just them, but cost others around them. I've seen men, we're going to sell our house and go do this, you know, and they don't go home and uh, pray with their wives, listen to their children, talk to their pastor, and if we're going to go on the mission field. You know, we're going to go do this. Well, they keep their vow to the detriment of their household. I, there are men that, that make ministry vows that lose their family, their most important ministry, over even keeping their promises. And this that would be the category I think Jeff uh, would fall into. He made a vow detrimental to his family. His only daughter. This is not. This is his only child. Not just. You know, we we certainly are not given the impression that Jeff uh, was like a lot of the Middle Eastern men where. You know, she's a woman, so she's the same as a dog or a, or a piece of cattle or a possession. Certainly the culture determined, a father did determine the life that his, who his daughter would marry, how she would live, a lot of things about his daughter, but he loved his daughter. You know, but again, it's one of those things where on the spur of a moment, in the heat of the moment, he made an emotional decision without saying, God, would this please you? You know, sometimes, man, if we could just add to our, I mean, that's the lesson. If we could just add to our willingness, God, you want this? Show me if you want it. And if you do, then God, I'm all in. And that would be the difference. Just that little addition. Instead of, God, I'm doing this. And, man, I'm going into the ministry. Man, there, there are men that have made a disaster out of the ministry by going into the ministry without asking God. I'm going to give myself to be a pastor. Well, you know what? The world doesn't need you to be a pastor. You're terrible. Yeah, I've seen guys destroy churches that I don't think were called into the ministry. You know, or uh, anyway. There, there's almost no way this is a useful vow. Any person that would have come out the door would have been a human sacrifice and against God's laws. Good point. Any, if it was an animal, there's lots of animals that would have been an abomination to sacrifice. If it had been a pig that had come out, it would have been an abomination to sacrifice that. He probably didn't have abomination. Well, whatever it was. <laughs> uh, if, even if it was an acceptable animal that came out, it could have been one with a blemish, and so it wouldn't have been the best, and that wouldn't have been acceptable either. I, I don't see any way this was a good idea. That's true. That's he should, he should have asked God. <laughs> yeah. To the, the yeah, point of it was his, his vow. Well, Pastor had stated as well that it, it wasn't valid. He wasn't. I'm not sure what was guiding his thinking necessarily. I'll be honest with you. I can't. I can't reason. I like what would want you to offer in that manner, as knowing what it requires, especially as an Israelite. I'm sorry, go ahead. A broken spirit and contrite heart, O oh God, thou will not despise. And. Uh, like Samuel told Saul, he says, obedience is better than sacrifice. And I, I think that, that just a, a worshipful heart toward God, that's, that just gives oneself and one's worship to God, is far more pleasing than something that we could pay. And this is probably where, similar to Saul, Jephthah misunderstood what God wants. He gave God something that impressed him. Some, a sacrifice that impressed him, but it wasn't a sacrifice that impressed God. And I think a lot of times a foolish vow comes from our being impressed with something. Ananias and Sapphira are another one. You know, here Barnabas mm. gives himself to the Lord, and he sells a piece of land, he gives it, and, and it just impressed Ananias and Sapphira. They said, wow, is that impressive. That guy gave his land. Barnabas didn't give his land, he gave himself. And then his land... You know, it was just natural because he's going to serve the Lord. He's going to travel with Paul and, and God. I mean, what's, what good is land going to do with a guy like Barnabas? He gave himself to the Lord and then sold his land and said, Well, I need this. I, what am I going to do that he gave that? And then Ananias and Sapphira like, Well, Barnabas gave his land. He didn't give it. That isn't what Barnabas really gave. And then they lied to the Holy Spirit because they, what impressed them didn't impress God. And Jephthah here falls into that same category of thinking, man, I'm going to really give something nobody's ever given before. I'm going to do something. And God says, you know, you're not really, I'm, remember who I am. 
you're not really going to impress me with something like that. God's not, I mean, God's word towards us is God not being impressed. It's just documented. And I love that about the scripture that documents foolish things people do as well as things that please God. So, anyway, I think that's another principle. In it. The interesting thing, if we were to go to Hebrews 11, he's actually specifically mentioned as somebody that pleased God by faith, with mm-hmm. his faith. Now, I don't know necessarily that that's referencing that's not this right. well, particular decision. Go ahead. Well, I mean, to me, it's a very stark contrast between he loved God so much that he followed through on his vow, and yet just before that, he you know, failed in making the vow. Um, so maybe it's because he followed through? Again, I don't know if that is necessarily referencing that act. Right. Um, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him to go forth to fight the children of Ammon. Um, in, in his listing here in Hebrews 11, now it doesn't, you kind of have to go back and forth to try and match who's, because it men- he's mentioned in a laundry list of people here. Um, and as what, what should I more say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and of Samuel, of the prophets. And then it's, it's interesting that that whole list are failures. Yeah. <laughs> like, every one of them, and the thing that pleased God about them was faith. And so that, the more the point of that passage in Hebrews 11 is that faith pleases God, not our actions. No, certainly, you know, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the whole point. Like, it's like failure, failure. I mean, I, you, Samson, Gideon, David, Jephthah. I mean, every one of them, the Bible documents their failure. Yeah, but yet very, God very is pleased too. by their faith. And man, if we can just get that notion of this is what I can do in the flesh. Look, I mean, Samson, I don't want to save Israel. You know, uh, Gideon, you know, I'm, he sets up his sons to be kings, basically, in his failure. And ultimately, and every one of them just had failures. Uh, undermined the good that they did, but their faith pleased God in spite of all that. And that's where the humanity of these people really comes in and helps us to see first of all, we can rest in our faith because, you know, it isn't what we do that's going to please God. It's our faith that pleases God. Man, that's a man, what a wonderful what a wonderful truth that is. It's true. And I guess to our final point is that Christ's standard or Christ, he doesn't change. And so if you vow, it's not, again, not necessary. Keep it. But his standard here in Matthew 5 says, Let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than this cometh of evil. In other words, I can't control outside factors, to be honest with you. And he gives illustration here. Uh, you know, most people when they vow or when they make an oath or when they swear, uh, it's either by heaven or by earth. Heaven is God's throne. Earth is God's footstool. Okay, by Jerusalem, the city of the great king. Okay, you're not in any kind of leadership position that has been any importance there. Okay, and neither shall thou swear by thy head. Does that kind of make one hair? white or black, in other words, you can't, you can't get your card. One last thing was about his daughter, I mean, if you call me to for your daughter's sentence, but his daughter, you know, we're upset about her. You know, we're thinking about it. She didn't have anything to do with this, and, you know, what, what are your women cattle, you know, she's just treated. But I would just like to remind us about a couple of things about her when I think about her. You know, Jonathan's another one that I, I feel the same way about. You know, his deadbeat dad wrecked his life. You know, if you look at Jonathan, I mean, Jonathan would have been king of Israel and a good one. He would have been a good king. He didn't do anything wrong. And yet his dad disqualified him to be king. Jephthah's daughter loved the Lord. Man, what a sweet girl runs out rejoicing in the victory that God's given. You know, it's a great girl. And even look at how she handles her dad's vow, saying, I want to go to the mountains of the way on my virginity. I want to remind us about how both of those individuals are spoken of in the scripture. Good light, nothing bad.
there's just nothing bad you can say about either of them. And I want to remind you about how rare a category that is. Like how rare it is for a person. I mean, we've got a Daniel, we've got a Job. I mean, how rare it is that we see no bad report about their entire life. And the question then goes to this. How, what is our life? It's even a vapor. Terry's for a while vanishes away. How better could their lives, could Jonathan's life or Jephthah's daughter's life, how better could their lives have been lived than to be used the way that they've been used for eternity and being recorded in an eternal book? In other words, if, if I had to ask Jonathan the question, hey man, any regrets? If I had asked Jephthah's daughter the question, any regrets? I think she'd say, look what God's done with my life on an eternal level. Like who serves God their whole life and has that level of impact? And we just, we love, we count our lives too dear. We love comfort and pleasure and we think that persecution or death are beneath us. And yet, so many times the individuals that God have used in the greatest way have done nothing better than to simply die graciously. That is with God's grace. It's amazing how God can take even a death that, humanly speaking, we would say is a waste or unnecessary. And He can use that. Man, if God's going to use me that way, sign me up. Good point. Senator, do you have any questions? Wow, okay, man. <laughs> so next week we'll be looking at the next judge in line. And so we'll be looking at the uh, judges further down into 12 and then going into 13. All right, so all questions were dismissed. Thanks, Charlie. I mean, you give me a time.